All right, this is going to be our lecture on the reproductive system, so help get your notes out. So reproduction, the production of a new individual for the propagation of the species. This is just making more of yourself. We have some words, gonads, organs which are responsible for the production of sex hormones, and gametes, G-A-M-E-T, E S. If you remember, gametes are the sex cells that we'll talk about in a minute. Males are fe or, uh, ova. I'm sorry, males are sperm, females are ova. Uh, they have both exocrine and endocrine functions. Exocrine has ducts, so they do have a duct which will deliver the gamete, whichever it is, the egg or the sperm, to a particular spot. So it delivers by way of a duct and endocrine, they both have endocrine cells which secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. Now males, the male gonads are called testes, T-E-S-T-E-S, -E -E testes. And the females uh, gonads are called ovaries, O-V-A-R-I-E-S, ovaries. Now gametes, the haploid reproductive sex cells. This is what we looked at in uh, general biology when we did meiosis, and we talked about uh, reducing the chromosome number to form haploid cells, which we called gametes, and male haploid, having one half the chromosome number of uh, gametes. Male gametes are called sperm, S-P-E-R-M, and female gametes are called ova, O-V-A, that's what we call eggs. So let's look at the male here. And we can see on the male that uh, the first thing here is a scrotum. And here's the scrotum, this cutaneous pouch here. You see my, my finger here pointing to it. Cutaneous pouch, which contains the testicles. The testicles are the primary sex organ of the male called testicles. This is what makes the sperm. Now there is a raphe, a median ridge in the middle. External, it's a median ridge. And the next word is septum, S-E-P-T-U-M, a loose connected tissue wall which divides the scrotum into two compartments, each containing one testicle. So you can see the wall right here. Septum means wall, and there it is. It says middle septum of the scrotum. So there's a wall. The dartos muscle, which you can see here's part of the scrotum over here, uh, containing the dartos muscle. There it is right below the skin of the scrotum. A subcutaneous muscle of the scrotum, which is also part of the septum. So it's also part of this wall that divides the scrotum into two compartments, one containing each testicle. This muscle causes the skin of the scrotum to wrinkle. You can kind of see a little wrinkling going on there on this picture. Then there is the cremaster muscle, C-R-E, M-A-S-T-E-R muscle, a continuation of the internal oblique muscle, which was up in the abdomen. Remember, it's part of your abdo abdominal wall. It says, which surrounds each of the spermatic cords and testicles. So it's covering what you can see on this left hand, this uh, right hand side of the picture. Left hand side has the muscle over it. It functions in controlling the temperature of the testes which need to be kept at a temperature of approximately three degrees lower than body temperature for maximum production of sperm. Okay, so that's why the testes are on the outside of the male's body. They have to be cooler than the body's core temperature to have an optimum chance of producing the, the, the most sperm that they, can, that they can. It does this by raising the testes during sexual arousal and upon exposure to the cold and by lowering the testes away from the body when they get too warm. The testes, that's your next blank there, T-E-S-T-E-S, -E -T -E testes, are the uh, primary, that's what the one with the degree mark is primary, sex organ of the male. Each testicle weighs about 10 to 15 grams. Okay, and so you can see the testes here. There's one you can see, the other one's covered up by the cremaster muscle. 
uh, usually descend. I mean, they usually fall out of the uh, abdominal cavity into the scrotum, the sac. And cryptorchidism is undescended testes, so they haven't quite gone from the uh, the abdomen here down into the test down into uh, the scrotum just yet. Sometimes they have to be what's called pulled down, or you know, made to come down to occupy the scrotum. Looking at um, some uh, cross section here. Here's a testicle here. And it's got a little tube on the back we'll look at in a minute called the epididymis, but we're going to look at some, some words here. The tunica vaginalis. Here it is. I'm pointing to it on the picture. An outpocketing of the parietal peritoneum. That's a serous membrane, which becomes a serous covering of the testicle. So it points out that there it is, and it covers the testicle. It goes around and reflects back on the surface of the testicle. Tunica vaginalis. Well, covering the surface of the testicle itself, and the vaginalis is on, the, on top of this, is called the tunica albuginea. A-L-B-U-G-I-N-E-A. -E tunica albuginea. A white fibrous capsule which covers each testicle, and there it is, this is white, and invaginates, it goes in to form septa or walls. It compartmentalizes this testicle into compartments, uh, which divide the testes into compartments called lobules. So each of the, each of the compartments is called a lobule, and between two and three hundred per testicle. So this tunica albuginea goes in and forms walls called septa. And it's all compartmental, compartmentalized on the inside. And the compartments that are formed by the walls of the septa, the compartments are called lobules. Now, the seminiferous tubules that you can see in these lobules, so yellow uh, strings here, long, highly coiled tubules, which occupy the lobules. These tubules are the sites of sperm production. All right, here is a seminiferous tubule here. It's been cut. And the sperm mature from the outside of the tubule to the inside. And there's the tails hanging on the inside of the lumen here, and they're going to be sloughed off. These tubules are the sites of sperm production. So here's one tubule, and then it got cut again over here. There's another piece there, another piece there. So you got cut several times because it's all wound up and stuffed into that lobule. So when they take a, a, a section, you get to cut that tubule in different different places along its length. They also contain the sustentacular or Sertoli cells. Um, they're called nurse cells now, N-U-R-S-E, which secrete inhibin to protect the developing spermatozoa from the male's immune system. And they also produce nutrients. So why would the male have to have uh, something called inhibin produced to protect the sperm. Well, there's two reasons. The sperm are haploid, for one thing. They're the only haploid cells in the body. And they have a flagellum. Both of those are odd or atypical to the rest of the cells in your body. And so this inhibin helps to protect them from being attacked by your immune system. Now, in between these tubules, here's part of the tubule, here's a tubule, there's a tubule, one over here, one over here. These cells right here we're looking at, the interstitial cells, they're also called interstitial endocrinocytes because endocrinocyte means endocrine cell. So these are the, the interstitial cells between the tubules. Cells located in the spaces between the tubules, which are responsible for the secretion of the male hormone, testosterone, testosterone. Now, spermatogenesis, we saw this in uh, general biology. This is meiosis in, in, in the male. Here is a spermatogonial cell. You see it's two in. That means it has two sets of uh, chromosomes, one set they got from mom and one set they got from dad. There's 23 in each set, so there's 46 chromosomes here. You see that during the process of meiosis, that number is reduced to just n, which means 23 chromosomes. These are haploid cells. And all the sperm have one set of chromosomes. They're haploid. And the process is called spermatogenesis. 
In females, it's called oogenesis, formation of eggs. <clears throat> now here is a spermatozoa, one of the sperm uh, produced by meiosis, sex cells. Remember I said they're all haploid. That goes in your blank, haploid, H-A-P-L-O-I-D, contain half the full chromosome number. And then your notes also I have what I just told you, diploid is 46 chromosomes, haploid is 23 chromosomes. Approximately 20, so approximately 300 million are produced per day. So males are constantly producing sperm. And they live approximately 48 hours in the female's reproductive tract. So they're viable for around two days in the female's reproductive tract. We look at the parts, and we see that there's a head here, and the head contains the parental DNA. There it is in the nucleus. That's where the 23 chromosomes are in the nucleus of this uh, head of the sperm. Uh, has a cap called an acrosome, A-C-R-O-S-O-M-E. It's this little cap here that contains an enzyme called hyaluronidase, H-Y-A-L-U-R-O-N-I-D-A-S-E, which aids the sperm in penetrating into the oocyte. The hyaluronidase has to digest through hyaluronic acid, which covers the oocyte. If this sperm does not have uh, hyaluronidase in its acrosome, it will not be able to fertilize any egg. The midpiece here contains mitochondria. That's what these are supposed to be here, a whole bunch of mitochondria, which use the sugar fructose to produce ATP for locomotion. The ATP for locomotion is number three for the tail, which is called a flagellum. Flagellum used to propel the sperm along its way. And we'll see where that fructose uh, came from in just a few minutes. On the back of the testicle is this highly coiled tubule called the epididymis. Now you can see it there and you can see it here. Here's the testicle and here's the epididymis, highly coiled on the back side of the testes. Well, epididymis is E P I D I D Y. M-I-S. It means a pond twin is what it means. A highly coiled tubule about 20 feet long. So it's all coiled up on the back of, the, of each testicle, which lies on the posterior border of the testicle. This is an area where sperm are stored and undergo final maturation. So they're produced by the seminiferous tubules. They're going to travel to this area called the reet testis. They're all going to drain and pool into the reet testis and then is sent out into the epididymis to mature. This is a duct from the testis, which uh, functions as a storage area for sperm before ejaculation, as well as an area for maturation. So they're gonna mature in this epididymis. The tails require 10 to 14 days for the tail to mature for motility. Now this epididymis, the inside of the tubule is lined with columnar epithelium with microvilli. Just in case the sperm aren't used, they can be broken down and, and reabsorbed. Contains smooth muscle and peristalsis, P-E-R-I-S-T-A-L-S-I-S, -S, delivers sperm toward the urethra. So it's gonna move the sperm out of the epididymis and then into this ductus deferens and toward the urethra. So this tube that leaves the epididymis, your next word is ductus deferens, D-U-C-T-U-S deferens, or it's also called the vas deferens. And they both mean a tubule which leads away. And you can see right here, there's your epididymis and the tube that leads away from the epididymis carrying the sperm is called the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. A vasectomy is where this is cut. They'll go in and they'll cut this ductus deferens or the vas deferens and tie off the two ends. They can even remove a little piece if, if they want to and tie the ends off. So vasectomy, vasectomy, a portion of the tubule which is removed and the two ends are tied off. That's a form of male sterilization. They have a blank with six things listed beside it. It's called the spermatic cord. S-P-E- R-M-A, 
T-I-C, second word is cord, C-O-R-D, and let's look at what it consists of. You can see most of it over here on the side, but not all of it very clearly. The ductus deferens or the vas deferens, of course, that's going to come from the, uh, you know, the back of the testicle and from the epididymis carrying the sperm. Testicular arteries, okay, arteries taking blood to the testes. Testicular veins, the, the removal of blood from the testes. You can't see the nerves in here, but autonomic nerves are, are in there. Lymphatic vessels, which you can't see that either. And then the cremaster muscle covers all this. You can see that on the left-hand side of this picture. So the cremaster muscle covers everything. So those are the six parts of the spermatic cord that are listed there. Now, when the testicle left the abdominal pelvic area and came down into the scrotum, it had to get there by way of a hole called the inguinal canal. I-N-G-U-I N-A-L, second word is just canal, C-A-N-A-L, a hole in the abdominal wall through which the spermatic cord passes. It's a weak spot in the floor of the abdomen which can tear open, causing an inguinal hernia. So if you ever heard about inguinal hernias, a guy will lift wrong, that's a circular hole, you lift wrong and the circle is pulled, it'll tear open. If it tears open, Abdominal contents, like the small intestine, can then start to fall down into the scrotum, and that can be quite painful. Um, they have to push it back up, and they put a little patch here. They saw a patch to close that hernia. Now, here comes the ductus deferens around the back of the urinary bladder. It's going to join with another um, duct from this vesicle here called the seminal vesicle and it goes through the prostate. This little purple structure right below, right below the urinary bladder is called the ejaculate, oh, so that's called the prostate and the duct is called the ejaculatory duct. So you have your word ejaculatory duct. The ductus deferens joins a duct from the seminal vesicle and enters the prostate as the ejaculatory duct. That's what it's called. Now the urethra is going to be leaving this urinary bladder and it has names as it goes along its way. So the prostatic urethra is about one inch long, P-R-O-S-T-A-T-I-C, is this urethra that is going through the prostate. And there it is in bold print, prostatic urethra. It passes through the urogenital diaphragm, the floor of the pelvis, in this kind of a, a short distance called the membranous urethra, about 0.5 inches in length. It's gonna pass through that urogenital diaphragm. And then it's in the lower cylinder of the penis. The penis has three cylinders of tissue. Uh, so this lower cylinder is called the spongy, spongy uh, corpus spongiosum. So this is called the spongy urethra. And there it is over here, spongy urethra. So number three, spongy, S-P-O-N, G Y. So let's look at this picture. Here is the penis and there's a cross section here on the bottom. There are three cylinders. The top two cylinders are called corpora cavernosa. It means cavernous bodies. And the one on the bottom is the corpus spongiosum. That's where the urethra is going through. So on the picture, you can see it's been opened up. You can see the urethra on this one. Well, when you go look at the uh, picture we were just looking at up here, here it is going through the center of that bottom cylinder, the corpus uh, uh, spongiosum. So you're seeing a profile of that urethra going through there. At the end of the urethra, there's a swollen spot here in the head of the penis, which is called the glans penis. The, the urethra swells. That little swollen area is not labeled here, but it's the navicular fossa. N-A-V-I-C-U-L-A-R fossa an enlargement of the distal end of the urethra in the area of the glans penis. The glans penis is the end of the penis, the head of the penis here. And then it leaves by way of the external urethral orifice. The end of the uh, urethra or urine comes out. That's the distal end of the urethra. Now we can use this, uh, this image here 
to look at the glands here. So we have accessory sex glands, glands which secrete most of the liquid portion of semen. Semen is a, a mixture of sperm and the secretions from these uh, three glands we're going to talk about. So let's look at the first one. The seminal vesicles. I have red arrows pointing to them. Seminal, S-E-M-I-N-A-L. Second word, vesicle, V-E-S-I-C-L-E-S. -E -E There's two of them. You see on the left and the right side. This is where the ductus deferens that came around it swells, that's called the ampulla of the ductus deferens, and then it's going to join the seminal vesicle uh, to form a single vessel. So let's look at what the seminal vesicles are, are for. Lie on the posterior surface of the urinary bladder, and there they are, left and right. They secrete a viscous, that means thick, alkaline fluid, rich in fructose. That's the fructose that the sperm are going to need to uh, you know, the mid piece is gonna have mitochondria that break down the fructose to supply the energy for the flagellum, the tail. Um, the alkalinity helps to neutralize the acidity of the female's reproductive tract. Uh, the female's reproductive tract is acidic to uh, uh, block any bacteria from living, okay? So it's, it's, it, uh, by changing the pH, that's going to keep the female's reproductive tract uh, relatively uh, free of bacteria. The fructose is used by the mitochondria of the sperm to produce ATP to power the flagellum. Now look at how much fluid, how much part of the semen is contributed by these seminal vesicles. 60% of the semen's volume comes from these two vesicles here. Now the prostate, remember the uh, ejaculatory duct as it goes through the prostate to join to the prostatic urethra, the prostate gland, PROS, T-A-T-E, second word is gland, a single donut-shaped gland about the size of a chestnut it is, it, 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 uh, it is inferior to the urinary bladder, so that means it's underneath it. It secretes a milky, and that's, that is also alkaline. I put, in my notes originally, I put acidic because of vitamin C is in there, but it is alkaline. Um, and several clotting enzymes to coagulate the semen shortly after ejaculation, after it's propelled out of the male's body into the female reproductive tract. So what would be the reason for uh, coagulating or solidifying the, the uh, semen containing the sperm for a while? Well, what it has to do is these alkaline fluids that are making up the semen are going to have to work to neutralize or buffer the female's reproductive tract, which is acidic. And so that's one reason that it gels to protect the sperm. Another is so that the sperm or the semen will not uh, leak out of the female's reproductive tract, and that would decrease the chance of fertilizing the female. So um, look at the percent of volume the prostate, the prostate gives. 30% of the semen's volume is contributed by the prostate gland. Well, the third one is a little easier to see on this picture. So here are the seminal vesicles up here, number five. Number seven is the prostate. And then this is the third one, number, I guess it's eight. At the base of the penis, it's called the bulbo-urethral gland. B-U-L-B-O-U-R-E-T-H. R-A-L gland, bulbo urethral gland, named after the base of the penis, which is called the bulb of the penis, and urethra, because it's joining to the, to the uh, urethra. About the size of a pea, they secrete an alkaline fluid to neutralize the acidity of the male urethra, because the male's penis is used for urination and copulation, you know, uh, sexual intercourse. Well, the urine is slightly acidic, and that will that'll damage the sperm. It'll kill them. So the pre-emissions would be this bubble urethral gland to help to buffer the male's urethra. So it says, um, to neutralize the acidity of the male urethra, as well as serving as a lubricant during sexual intercourse. And it's about 5% of the semen volume. So the seminal vesicles, 60%, prostate, roughly 30%, and the bubble urethral, 5%, that's 95%. So where's the other 5% coming from? That's going to be sperm. Sperm are the remaining 5%. Now look at your blank. The blank is semen. S-E-M-E-N. 
semen, a mixture of sperm and the secretions from the accessory glands. This is a volume about the size, about 2.5 to 5 mils with 50 to 150 million sperm per milliliter. It's a lot of sperm. Less than 20 million sperm per milliliter is considered to be on the borderline of being sterile. So if you don't produce more than that, you're going to have a harder chance of, uh, of fertility. Sterility depends on the number of sperm. See, less than 20 million. Uh, some are going to die in the female's reproductive tract because they're exposed on the outside to the female's uh, acid environment. So they're going to die immediately. And the ones that actually make it in to the female's reproductive tract then are divided into left and right uh, fallopian tubes, and then they have to make it over to the egg. So number two, size and shape of the sperm. Uh, well, they, they might not have, uh, the head might, might not be fully developed. Uh, getting into number four, uh, motility. Uh, they, they may have not, a tail that's not modal. They may have two tails, two flagella. And there's no coordinated movement with two flagella. The sperm cannot move in a particular direction because they're both beating. So that they might have a, a, a problem with the flagellum being modal, non-modal, too many flagella, maybe not even a flagellum. And then the presence of hyaluronidase in the acrosome to dissolve the hyaluronic acid around the ovum. It's got to have an acrosome with hyaluronidase in it. It's a transportation medium. That's what semen is. Contains nutrients. The, the, the fructose is one of them. Neutralizes the acidity because it's an alkaline secretion. Uh, seminoplastin is an antibiotic which destroys bacteria and the reproductive tracts. So it also has an antibiotic that the male's body produces to help keep bacterial population counts down. Now we have the penis, that's your blank, P-E-N-I-S, the male copulatory organ, functions in urination and copulation. Copulation, remember, is sexual intercourse. So it's the male copulatory organ, is the penis. The primary sex organ is the testes. So looking at your, your cylinders here, the top two cylinders on the, on the back of the uh, Penis, or these top two here, corpora cavernosa, C-A-V-E-R-N-O-S-A. -E the top dorsolateral two cylinders of tissue. And you see that they have an artery in the middle. They usually label this artery the deep artery. And this is how these two cylinders are going to fill with blood that we're going to talk about in just a minute to achieve an erection. The bottom cylinder that has the urethra in it, the spongy urethra. This is called the corpus spongiosum, S-P-O-N-G-I-O-S-U-M. It's going to stay soft or spongy. The lower cylinder of tissue. You see, if this is a, a similar to like you put a blood pressure cuff around your arm and when you inflate the pressure, when the pressure around your brachial artery increases, it closes off the brachial artery. If this lower cylinder were to inflate with blood or fill with blood, it would close off the urethra and it would uh, uh, inhibit the propulsion of semen from the male's uh, reproductive tract. So the corpus spongiosum does not fill with blood. So let's read this next little paragraph. During sexual arousal, arteries which convey blood to the two corpora cavernosa, these two top cylinders here, vasodilate, the arteries get big, and engorge, they fill these two cylinders with blood. So these, the blood pressure is going to force blood into these corpora cavernosa and fill them with blood. The veins which drain blood from these two cylinders undergo vasoconstriction, so it can't drain off very fast and restricted blood uh, restricts blood from leading the two cylinders. The result of these two cylinders filling with blood, these two corpora cavernosa, is called an erection. So blood pressure is what drives an erection fills these two cylinders, these two corpora cavernosa with blood. The corpus spongiosum, the lower one, does not undergo this process due to the fact that it would close off the urethra and not allow passage of the semen. The propulsion of semen from the urethra to the exterior is called ejaculation. E-J 
A-C-U-L-A-T-I-O-N, ejaculation. Now here's a picture of the head of the penis here, the glands. That's the glands penis there. Uh, it means acorn, it's the head of the penis. And there is a flap of skin which covers that called a prepus or foreskin. And I put a little box here for you. Foreskin is F-O-R-E-S-K-I-N. A loose fitting flap of skin covering the glands. There's also one, a clitoral hood, clitoral prepus also covers the clitoris in the female. This flap of skin is removed during a process called circumcision. That's done for hygiene and or religious purposes, removal of this foreskin. That's called being circumcised. Okay, that's the end of the male reproductive system.